Hello, and welcome to Soil Health Basics. My name is Mara Gittleman. I'm the Workshops and Education Coordinator for NYC Parks Green Thumb, the part of the New York City Parks Department that works with over 550 community gardens across the five boroughs. If you were going to take someone on a tour of soil in your neighborhood, where would you take them? Think of three places with different soil. In what ways is the soil different at each place? Maybe some places have lighter colored, dusty, compact soil and others have dark, moist, fluffy soil. Maybe some are actively managed and others are not. If you already understand why some soils are different than others, then you already know a lot about your soil. For example, soil that is lighter in color and dusty in texture has often been compacted by foot traffic and other uses. When all of the air pockets are compressed, the soil can no longer hold air and water so it dries out quickly. And without a regular addition of new organic matter, the nutrients have probably leached out, leading to a lighter shade of soil. So in this talk, we're going to talk, look at soil structure and components, introduce the basics of soil life, and discuss best practices for soil care when planting out your garden. Gary Zimmer, in his book, The Biological Farmer, says, we could say that whenever a part of the natural soil plant system is eliminated, such as soil life killed by pesticides or plant matter harvested, the farmer has to take over the job of the part eliminated. So what is soil? The USDA's definition is soil is the unconsolidated mineral or organic material on the immediate surface of the earth that serves as a natural medium for the growth of land plants. But what does that mean for us as gardeners? So in an ideal situation, soil is actually only around 50% stuff like minerals and organic matter and 50% pore space for air and water. This leaves space to grow, for roots to grow, water to flow, soil life to live, and gas exchange. In an undisturbed environment, soil naturally presents itself in layers. On the bottom, we have mostly mineral matter from weathered bedrock working its way upwards. On top, we have a layer of organic matter from decomposed plants and animals working its way downward through gravity and water leaching. They meet in the middle and mix. That top layer is also known as topsoil and is such a valuable resource. So let's look at the four components of soil, mineral, water, air, and organic matter. Minerals account for most of what we see when we're looking at soil. It comes from weathered bedrock and has strong influence over the structure of the soil. Larger particles will allow water to drain through, while smaller particles will hold nutrients and water in place. There are three sizes when it comes to mineral material, sand, which is relatively large, coarse, and porous, clay, which has very small particles, doesn't allow water flow, but does retain a lot of, lot of water, and silt, which is somewhere in between. Clay is responsible for holding plant nutrients in place. Nutrients like calcium and magnesium stick to it through electromagnetism. The nutrients can be bumped off the clay particles and made available to plants through a few different natural processes. Water is a crucial part of soil. This is where the microbial life live. No water, no microbial life, and we'll learn about the importance of microbial life in a little bit. Water is where nutrients are dissolved, which is how the nutrients become available to plants. When plants pull in water, the dissolved nutrients come with it, feeding the plant. When we talk about a soil's capacity to hold water, it's often called field capacity. At field capacity, 50% of the water is available for plants to take up. The other 50% is attached to the minerals and organic matter and is unavailable to plant roots. You can imagine it as a sponge. If you put a sponge in a bucket of water and pull it out without squeezing, field capacity is when the water has stopped dripping, but you haven't yet wrung it out. The sponge has released any excess water, but is still holding as much water as it can. This is where the microbial life lives in the soil. Most of the beneficial microbes, fungi, and life in the soil is aerobic, meaning it requires air. The pockets between mineral particles allow space for roots to grow, water to flow, and gas exchange. So when soil is compacted under heavy foot traffic, heavy machinery, buildings, etc., we lose these functions. 
Organic matter, which as you recall can make up around 5% of soil, contains dead plants, bugs, fungi, and microbes that are either actively being broken down or have finished breaking down. Organic matter adds additional nutrients to the soil, supplementing what's available through mineral content. When fully decomposed, organic matter is called humus and is about the same size as clay. This also means it can hold nutrients in a plant available form, just like clay, and is great for holding water. Humus has no trace of stems or roots and is a mixture of the building blocks of life, carbohydrates, amino acids, enzymes, and other elements. It is the organisms in soil that convert those nutrients in the sand, silt, clay, rocks, and pebbles from non-available forms into plant-available forms. If the beneficial organisms in soil are killed through soil compaction or heavy chemicals, plants can no longer get mineral nutrients from the soil. If plants can't get mineral nutrients, then they will either die or we humans will have to take over providing those nutrients as inorganic fertilizers. We are not good at knowing what plants, what nutrients plants require at any given instant, and so we might put on too much or too little in the wrong places at the wrong time, and the soil and plants are harmed even more. Excess nutrients may also leach out of the soil and destroy soil further down the hill and our waterways. So if your plants are showing, showing signs of poor fertility, consider supporting the soil life first through aeration, proper irrigation, adding amendments like compost and fish emulsion, and covering the soil with wood chips or straw. There are lots of ways to assess your soil to learn more information. One way is the jar test, where you take a jar, fill it halfway with soil, and the rest with water. Shake it up and leave it on the counter for two days to let everything settle. The sand and gravel will sink first, followed by silt, followed by a subtle layer of clay. If you're very curious, you can actually measure the thickness of each layer using a ruler and calculate percentages. Then you can use a tool like this to see what kind of soil you have. In the jar in the previous image, uh, the soil had 20% clay, 35% silt, and 45% sand. So we'd categorize that as a loam. Nice for gardening. You can also do a ribbon test. Take a handful of soil and get it wet enough to squeeze into a ball. Then push that ball a little at a time through your pointer finger and thumb. If you see a ribbon like this, your soil probably has too much clay. If the soil doesn't form a ball at all, your soil probably has too many large particles like sand and gravel. And if you're able to create a little bit of a ribbon before it breaks off, great, you're somewhere in the middle. You can also do a simple drainage test to assess how much or how little watering you're likely going to need to do. Dig a hole 12 inches deep and fill with water. Let it drain. Fill it again. If the water drains within 24 hours, you have good drainage. If there's still water there after 24 hours, you may need to amend the soil with new, new topsoil, compost, mulch, and aeration. One thing we can do is protect the soil from damage by wind or water erosion by making sure any bare areas are planted out or covered with mulch. We can also protect the microbial life in the soil. As Pam Thomas says, the dust bowl is an example of what happens when soil life dies. So let's talk about soil life. Soil life operates in a food web, like all other food webs you might be familiar with from grade school. Bigger things eat smaller things, which in turn eat things that are even smaller. Soil life includes decomposers that break down dead things like fungi and microbes that can help loosen nutrients off soil particles. And the important part for our plants in all of this is the waste. Animal, bug, and microbe waste is essentially plant food and is often easily dissolvable in water for uptake by plants. Fungi can break down dead organic matter in soil and creates vast underground networks that transport nutrients in water. Bacteria grow and live in thin water films around soil particles and near roots in an area called the rhizosphere. They help soil particles stick together in aggregates through their mucus-like secretions. So if the soil is nice and crumbly, you can thank the beneficial bacteria. And if the soil is dusty and blowing away, chances are the bacteria have died. Bacteria also play an important role in recycling nutrients, like other components of soil life. Some plants form mutually beneficial relationships with bacteria and fungi by releasing sugars into the rhizosphere to feed them and keep them around. Actinomycetes are a large group of bacteria that grow as hyphae-like fungi. They 
are responsible for the characteristically earthy smell of freshly turned healthy soil. Actinomycetes decompose a wide array of substrates, but are especially important in degrading hard to decompose compounds such as cellulose. Annual plants like vegetables and flowers prefer a bacteria-rich soil. Bacteria are visible under a microscope. They're the tiny bubbles you can see in between particles. They are the earliest life form on Earth and rarely die of old age, usually only when something else eats them or their environment changes. Bacteria hold nutrients in their bodies just living their lives, waiting to get recycled into plant food. Bacteria eat the greens in compost and soil. And fungi eat the browns in compost and soil. Here's a photo of fungi. You can see the mycelial network. Nematodes are often present in soils and are so much fun to encounter under a microscope. They can feed on bacteria, fungi, plant roots, and other organisms. So some nematodes, the root-eating ones, are bad for plants, and you'll know they're present if their roots, if their roots are knotted and full of strange nodules. The antidote is to release the nematodes that eat other nematodes, which I believe you can purchase online. There are bitter, bigger critters too, of course, that we can see. These also help recycle nutrients, making them available to plants through their waste. So in summary, for nutrients to be available for plants, they must be either dissolved in the soil's water, and there has to be enough water present to hold the nutrients, or they need to be held loosely on soil colloids, which are the super tiny particles, the clay and the humus. Nutrients are tied up in mineral and organic matter. For example, a plant can't access the calcium that's buried inside a pebble or the nitrogen held in a freshly fallen leaf. They become available through the weathering of minerals, root producing acids, root uptake, and microbial activity. This image takes a closer look at the relationship plants form with soil microbes when they release sugars they produced with photosynthesis into the soil. The shaded area is called the rhizosphere and is usually about one to two millimeters around the plant roots. Lots of nutrient exchange happens in the rhizosphere and helps the plant stay healthy. Another factor that affects plant health is the pH of the soil. We may know that a low pH is acidic and a high pH is basic, but why do our plants have a preference at all? Different nutrients become available or unavailable based on the pH. Many nutrients are available at a neutral pH of 6.5 to 7, so that's often recommended as the sweet spot for gardening. However, you may have heard that certain plants like blueberries, prefer acidic soil, and this is because they prefer the nutrients that become available in acidic soil. Another example is the hydrangea, which has flowers that can change color based on the pH of the soil. Gardening supply shops will often sell soil amendments for hydrangea growers who want to influence the color of their blooms. Let's take a look at some best practices for soil care. Tailor your soil practices to the plants you plan to grow. Annuals such as vegetables and flowers like zinnias prefer rich, moist soil. You can fertilize mid-season with compost, fish emulsion, or other natural fertilizers. Native plants generally prefer somewhat poorer soil, which encourages the roots to grow, searching for nutrients. If the soil is too rich, the roots are likely to remain shallow, making them less resilient in a drought or storm. The only exception are shade-loving native plants, which have often evolved in an environment like a forest, which has a forest floor rich in organic matter. Unless you're converting a bare, compacted area into a garden for the first time, if you're working with an existing garden plot, aerate gently before planting by pressing a digging fork into the ground and pulling back and forth. Move the fork 6 to 12 inches and do it again. You don't actually need to flip the soil over or create a big upheaval. That could damage the delicate fungal networks and soil life. Then you can add compost and rake the soil flat to get ready for planting. When planting a new plant, dig a hole slightly larger than the plant pot. Water the hole deeply and mix compost in with the soil you dug out before backfilling. If planting perennials, cover the soil with wood chips. These will create a friendly environment for fungi, which perennials prefer in their soil. If planting annuals, cover the soil with more compost or straw, which will create a bacteria-rich environment. Thank you for watching and have a great gardening season. Follow NYC Parks Green Thumb on social media for more gardening content.